after smoking and meditating, this book is exactly what I need. So let me pull it up. So the book I'm reading is Huey P. Newton, uh, Revolutionary Suicide. So. Pulling it up right now. It says, for my mother and father who have given me strength and made me unafraid of death and therefore unafraid of life. Mm -mm, I'm probably going to get this long introduction. Sorry. <laughs> Let's see. Ooh, but I do have to read the tribute to Little Bobby. All right, a tribute to Little Bobby. Little Bobby was the beginning, the very first member of the Black Panther Party. He gave not only his finances, he gave himself. He placed himself in the service of his people and asked nothing in return, not even a needle or a piece of thread. He asked neither security nor high office, but he demanded those things that are the birthright of all men, dignity and freedom. He demanded this for himself and for his people. Like a bright ray of light moving across the sky, little Bobby came into our lives and showed us the beauty of our people. He was a living example of an infinite love for his people and for freedom. Now he has moved on and the example he gave will serve as a beacon that lights our way and leads us on in the struggle for life, dignity, and freedom. We salute little Bobby and his family for what they have given us. He was the beginning of the party. Let us make sure that his thinking, his desires for his people become a way of life forever or I'm sorry, yours forever, Huey P. Newton, Minister of Defense, Black Panther Party, April 1968. Revolutionary suicide. By having no family, I inherited the family of humanity. By having no possessions, I have possessed all. By rejecting the love of one, I received the love of all. By surrendering my life to the revolution, I found eternal life. Revolutionary suicide, Huey P. Newton. A manifesto. Let a new earth rise, let another world be born. Let a bloody peace be written in the sky. Let a second generation full of courage issue forth. Let a people loving freedom come to growth. Let a beauty full of healing and strength of final clenching be the pulsing in our spirits and our blood. Let the marital songs be written. Let the dirges of despair. Let a race of men now rise and take control. Margaret Walker for my people. Revolution, revolutionary suicide, the way of liberty. For 22 months in the California men's colony at San Luis Obispo, after my first trial for the death of patrolman John Fry, I was almost continually in solitary confinement. There in four by six cell, except for books and papers relating to my case, I was allowed no reading material. Despite the rigid enforcement of this rule, inmates sometimes slipped magazines under my door when the guards were not looking. One that reached me was the May 1970 issue of Ebony Magazine. It contained an article written by Lacey Banco summarizing the work of Dr. Herbert Hinden, who had done a comparative study on suicide among Black people in the major American cities. Dr. Hendon found that the suicide rate among Black men between the ages of 19 and 35 had doubled in the past 10 years to 15 years, surpassing the rate for whites in the same age range. The article had, and still has, a profound effect on me. I have thought long and hard about its implications. The Ebony article brought to mind Durkham's classic study, Suicide, a book I had read earlier while studying sociology at Oakland City College. To Durkheim, all types of suicide are related to social conditions. He maintains that the primary cause of suicide is not individual temperament, but forces in the social environment. In other words, suicide is caused primarily by external factors, not internal ones. As I thought about the conditions of Black people and about Dr. Hendon's study, I began to develop Durkheim's analysis and apply it to the Black experience in the United States. This eventually led to the concept of revolutionary suicide. To understand revolutionary suicide, it is first necessary to have an idea of reactionary suicide, for the two are very different. 
Dr. Hendon was describing reactionary suicide, the reaction of a man who takes his own life in response to social conditions that overwhelm him and condemn him to helplessness. The young black men in this study had been deprived of human dignity, crushed by oppressive forces, and denied their right to live as proud and free human beings. A section in Crime and Punishment provides a good analogy. One of the characters, Mar Marmadov, a very poor man, argues that poverty is not a vice. In poverty, he says, a man can attain the innate nobility of soul that is not possible in beggar, for while society may drive the poor man out with the stick, the beggar will be swept out with the broom. Why? Because the beggar is totally demeaned, his dignity lost. Finally, bereft of self-respect, immobilized by fear and despair, he sinks into self-murder. This is reactionary suicide. Connected to, re to reactionary suicide, although even more painful and degrading, is a spiritual death that has been the experience of millions of Black people in the United States. This death is found everywhere today in the Black community, as victims have ceased to fight the forms of oppression that drink their blood. The common attitude has long been, what's the use? If a man rises up against a power as great as the United States, he will not survive. Believing this, Many Blacks have been driven to a death of the spirit rather than of the flesh, lapsing into lives of quiet desperation. Yet all the while, in the heart of every Black, there is the hope that life will somehow change in the future. I do not think that life will change for the better without an assault on the establishment, which goes on exploiting the wretched of the earth. This belief lies at the heart of the, con of the concept of revolutionary suicide. Thus, it is better to oppose the forces that would drive me to self-murder than to endure them. Although I ask, I'm sorry, although I risk the likelihood of death, there is at least the possibility, if not the probability, of changing intolerable conditions. This possibility is important because much in human existence is based upon hope without any real understanding of the odds. Indeed, we are all, black and white alike, ill in the same way, mortally ill. But before we die, how shall we live? I say with hope and dignity, and if premature death is the result, that death has a meaning reactionary suicide can never have. It is the price of self-respect. Revolutionary suicide does not mean that I and my comrades have a death wish. It means just the opposite. We have such a strong desire to live with hope and human dignity that existence without them is impossible. When reactionary forces crush us, we must move against those forces, even at the risk of death. We will have to be driven out with a stick. Che Guevara said that to a revolutionary death is the reality and victory, the dream. Because the revolutionary lives so dangerously, his survival is a miracle. Uh, Bakunin, who spoke for the most militant wing of the first international, made a similar statement in his revolutionary catechism. To him, the first lesson a, re a revolutionary must learn is that he is a doomed man. Unless he understands this, he does not grasp the essential meaning of his life. When Fidel Castro and his small band were in Mexico preparing for the Cuban revolution, many of the comrades had little understanding of, I'm saying this name so wrong, Bakunin's rule? <laughs> a few hours before they set sail, Fidel went from man to man asking who should be notified in case of death. Only then did the deadly seriousness of the revolution hit home. Their struggle was no longer romantic. The scene had been exciting and animated, but when the simple, overwhelming questioning of death arose, everyone fell silent. Many so-called revolutionaries in this country, black and white, are not prepared to accept this reality. The Black Panthers are not suicidal. Neither do we romanticize the consequences of revolution in our lifetime. Other so-called revolutionaries cling to an illusion that they might have their revolution and die of old age. That cannot be. I do not expect to live through our revolution and most serious comrades probably share my realism. Therefore, the expression revolutionary in our lifetime means something different to me than it does to other people who use it. I think, the revolution will grow in my lifetime, but I do not expect to enjoy its fruits. That would be a contradiction. The reality will be grimmer. 
I have no doubt that the revolution will triumph. The people of the world will prevail, seize power, seize the means of production, wipe out racism, capitalism, reactionary intercommunalism, reactionary suicide. The people will win a new world. Yet when I think of individuals in the revolution, I cannot predict their survival. Revolutionaries must accept this fact, especially the black revolutionaries in America, whose lives are in constant danger from the evils of a colonial society. Considering how we must live, it is not hard to accept the concept of revolutionary suicide. In this, we are different from white radicals. They are not faced with genocide. The greater, more immediate problem is the survival of the entire world. If the world does not change, all its people will be threatened by the greed, exploitation, and violence of the power structure in the American empire. The handwriting is on the wall. The United States is jeopardizing its own existence and the existence of all humanity. If Americans knew the disasters that lay ahead, they would transform the society tomorrow for their own preservation. The Black Panther Party is the vanguard of the revolution that seeks to relieve this country of its crushing burden of guilt. We are determined to establish true equality and the means of creative work. Some see our struggle as a symbol of the trend toward suicide among Blacks. Scholars and academics in particular have been quick to make this accusation. They fail to perceive differences. Jumping off a bridge is not the same as moving to wipe out the overwhelming force of, a, of an oppressive army. When scholars call our actions suicidal, they should be logically consistent and describe all historical revolutionary movements in the same way. Thus the American colonists, the French of the late 18th century, the Russian of 1917, the Jews of Warsaw, the Cubans, the, the, I'm sorry, the NLF, the North Vietnamese, any people who struggle against a brutal and powerful force are suicidal. Also, if the Black Panther symbolizes a suicidal trend among Blacks, then the whole third world is suicidal because the third world fully intends to resist and overcome the ruling class of the United States. If scholars wish to carry their analysis further, they must come to terms that with four-fifths of the world, which is bent on wiping out the power of the empire. In those terms, the third world would be transformed from suicidal to homicidal, although homicide is the unlawful taking of life and the third world is involved only in defense. Is the coin then turned? Is the government of the United States suicidal? I think so. With this redefinition, the term revolutionary suicide is not as simplistic as it might seem initially. In coining the phrase, I took two knowns and combined them to make them an unknown. A neoteric phrase in which the word revolutionary transformed the word suicide into an idea that has different dimensions and meanings, applicable to a new and complex situation. My prison experience is a good example of revolutionary suicide in action. For prison is a microcosm of the outside world. From the beginning of my sentence, I defied the authorities by refusing to cooperate. As a result, I was confined to lock up a solitary cell. As the months passed and I remained steadfast, they came to regard my behavior as suicidal. I was told that I would crack and break under the strain. I did not break, nor did I retreat from my position. I grew strong. If I had submitted to their exploitation and done their will, it would have killed my spirit and condemned me to a living death. To cooperate in prison meant reactionary suicide to me. While solitary confinement can be physically and mentally destructive, my actions were taken with an understanding of the risk. I had to suffer through a certain situation. By doing so, my resistance told them that I rejected all they stood for. Even though my struggle might have harmed my health, even killed me, I looked upon it as a way of raising the consciousness of the other inmates, as a contribution to the ongoing revolution. Only resistance can destroy the pressures that cause reactionary suicide. The concept of revolutionary suicide is not defeatist or fatalistic. On the contrary, it conveys an awareness of reality in combination with the possibility of hope. Reality because the revolutionary must always be prepared to face death and hope because it symbolizes a resolute determination to bring about change. Above all, it demands that the revolutionary see his death and his life as one piece. Chairman Mao says that death comes to all of us, but it varies in its significance. To die for the reactionary is lighter than a feather. To die for the revolution is heavier than Mount Tai. Part one.
Let me grab some water. Part one. During those long years in the Oakland public schools, I did not have one teacher who taught me anything relevant to my own life or experience. This is a poem by Richard Wright. Well, it's a preface from Black Metropolis. It says, many migrants like us were driven and pursued in the matter of characters in a Greek play down the paths of defeat, but luck must have been with us for we somehow survived. This section is called Starting Out. Life does not always begin at birth. My life was forged in the lives of my parents before I was born and even earlier in the history of all black people. It is all of a piece. I have little knowledge of my grandparents or those who went before. Racism destroyed our family history. My father's father was a white rapist. Both of my parents were born in the deep South. My father in Alabama, my mother in Louisiana. In the, in the mid thirties, their families migrated to Arkansas where my parents met and married. They were very young in their mid teens. Some said too young to marry, but my father, Walter Newton is a very good talker. And when he decided he wanted Armelia Johnson for his bride, she found him hard to resist. He was always known how to be a charming. Even today, I love to see his eyes light up with that special glow when he gets ready to work his magic. They were married in Parkdale, Arkansas, and lived there for seven years before moving to Louisiana to take advantage of better employment prospects. My father was not typical of Southern Black men in the 30s and 40s. Because of his strong belief in the family, my mother never worked at an outside job, despite seven children and considerable economic hardship. Walter Newton is rightly proud of his role as family protector. To this day, my mother has never left her home to earn money. My father believed in work. He worked constantly in a variety of jobs, usually holding several at one time to provide for us. During those years in Louisiana, he worked in a gravel pit, a carbon plant, in sugarcane mills and sawmills. He eventually became a railroad brakeman for the Union Sawmill Company. This pattern did not change when he moved to Oakland. As a youngster, I well remember my father leaving one job in the afternoon, coming home for a while, then going to the other. In spite of this, he always found time for his family. It was always high quality time when he was home. In addition, my father was a minister. He pastored the Bethel Baptist Church in Monroe, Louisiana, and later assisted in several of Oakland's churches. His preaching was powerful, if a little unusual. The Reverend Newton planned his sermons in advance and announced the topic a week early, but he never seemed able to preach the sermon he had chosen. Eventually, he adopted the practice of stepping right into the pulpit and letting the Spirit move him to deliver whatever message was appropriate. As a child, I, well, I swelled up, proud to see him up there, leading church services, moving the congregation with his messages. All of us shared the dignity and respect he commanded. Walter Newton is not a a particularly tall man, but when he stepped into that pulpit, he was the biggest man in the world to me. My mother likes to say that she married young and finished growing up with her children, and this is true. Only 17 years separate her from Lee Edward, the oldest child in the family. When my older brothers and sisters were growing up in Louisiana, mother was one of their best playmates. She played ball, jack rocks, and hide and go seek. Sometimes my father joined in rolling tires and shooting marbles and keeping the rules straight. The sense of family, fun, and participation has helped to keep us close. My parents are more than the word usually implies. They are also our friends and companions. My mother's sense of humor affected all of us. It was pervasive, an attitude toward life that led us to insight, affection, humor, and understanding with each other. She helped us to see the light side in even the most difficult situations. This lightness and balance have carried me through some difficult days. Often when others expect to find me depressed by difficult cir circumstances, and especially by the extreme condition of prison, they see that I look at things in another way. Not that I am happy with the suffering. I simply refuse to be defeated by it. I was born in Monroe, Louisiana on February 17, 1942, the last of seven children. Like other Black people of that time and place, I was born at home. They tell me that my mother was quite sick while she carried me, but mother says only that I was a fine and pretty baby. 
my brothers and sisters must have agreed because they often teased me when I was young, telling me I was too pretty to be a boy, that I should have been a girl. This baby-faced appearance dogged me for a long time, and it was one of the reasons I fought so often in school. I looked younger than I actually was and soft, which encouraged schoolmates to test me. I had to show them. When I went to jail in 1968, I still had the baby face. Until then, I rarely shaved. My parents named me after Huey Pierce Long, the former governor of Louisiana, assassinated seven years before I came along. Even though he could not vote, my father had a keen interest in politics and followed the campaigns carefully. Governor Long had impressed him by his ability to talk one philosophy while carrying out programs that moved Louisiana in exactly the opposite direction. My father says he was up front, looking right into his mouth, when Huey P. Long made a speech about how Black men in the hospitals, out of their minds and half-naked, had to be cared for by white nurses. This was, of course, unacceptable to Southern whites, and therefore a number of Black nurses were recruited to work in Louisiana hospitals. This was a major breakthrough in employment opportunities for Black professionals. Huey Long used this tactic to bring other beneficial programs to Blacks, free books in the schools, free commodities for the poor, public road and bridge construction projects that gave Blacks employment. While most whites were blinded by Long's outwardly racist philosophy, many Blacks found their lives significantly improved. My father believed that Huey P. Long had been a great man, and he wanted to name a son after him. In our family, there was a tradition that each older child had particular responsibility for a younger one, looking after him at play, feeding him, taking him to school. This was called giving the newborn to an older brother or sister. The older child had the privilege of first taking the new baby outdoors. I was given to my brother, Walter Jr. A few days after I was born, he took me outside, hauled me up onto the back of a horse, and circled the house while the rest of the family followed. This ritual is undoubtedly a surviving Africanism from the age-old matriarchal communal tradition. I do not remember that or anything else of our life in Louisiana. Everything I know about that time, I learned from the family. In 1945, we followed my father to Oakland when he came west to look for work in the wartime industries. I was three years old. The great exodus of poor people out of the South during World War II sprang from the hope for a better life in the big cities of the North and West. In search of freedom, they left behind centuries of Southern cruelty and repression. The Futility of search is now history. The Watts, Detroit, and many others stand as testament that racism is as oppressive in the North as it is in the South. Oakland is no different. The Chamber of Commerce boasts about Oakland's busy seaport, its museum, professional baseball and football teams, and the beautiful sports coliseum. The politicians speak of an efficient city government and the well-administered poverty program. The poor know better, and they will tell you a different story. Oakland has one of the highest unemployment rates in the country, and for the Black population, it's even higher. This was not always the case. After World War I, there was a hectic period of industrial expansion again during World War II, when government recruiters went into the South and encouraged thousands of Blacks to come to Oakland to work in the shipyards and wartime industries. They came and stayed after the war, although there were few jobs and they were no longer wanted. Because of the lack of employment opportunities in Oakland today, the number of families on welfare is the second highest in California, even though the city is the fifth largest in the state. The police department has a long history of brutality and hatred of Blacks. 25 years ago, official crime became so bad that the California state legislator investigated the Oakland force and found corruption so pervasive that the police chief was forced to resign and one policeman was tried and sentenced to jail. The Oakland system, in quotes, has not changed since then. Police brutality continues and corruption persists. Not everyone in Oakland will admit this, particularly the power structure and the privileged white middle class, but then none of them actually live in Oakland. Oakland spreads from the northern border of Berkeley, dominated by the University of California with its liberal to radical lifestyle, south to the port of Oakland and Jack London Square, a complex of mediocre motels, novelty shops, and restaurants with second rate food. To the west, Eight miles across the bay, spanned by the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, is a metropolitan San Francisco. To the east, 
is a lily white bedroom city called San Lorendo. I don't know if I said that right. There are two very distinct geographic Oaklands, the flatlands and the hills. In the hills and the rich area known as Piedmont, the upper middle and upper class, the bosses of Oakland live among them former United States Senator William Nolan, the owner of the ultra conservative Oakland Tribune, Oakland's only newspaper. His neighbors include the mayor, the district, the district attorney, and other wealthy white folks who live in big houses surrounded by green trees and high fences. The other Oakland, the Flatlands, consistent of substandard income families that make up about 50% of the population of nearly 450,000. They live in either rundown, crowded West Oakland, dilapidated East Oakland, hemmed and block after block in ancient decaying structures, now cut up into multiple dwellings. Here, the majority of Blacks, Chicanos, and Chinese people struggle to survive. The landscape of East and West Oakland is depressing. It resembles a crumbling ghost town, but a ghost town with inhabitants, among them more than 20, I'm sorry, 200,000 Blacks, nearly half of the city's population. There is a dreary gray monotony about Oakland's flatlands, broken only by a few large and impressive buildings in the downtown section. Among them, significantly, the Alameda County Courthouse, which includes a jail, and the Oakland Police Headquarters building, a 10-story streamlined fortress for which no expense was spared in its construction. Oakland is a ghost town in the sense that many American cities are. And white middle class has fled to the hills and their indifference to the plight of the city's poor is everywhere evident. Like countless other black families in the 40s and 50s, we fell victim to this indifference and corruption when we moved to Oakland. It was as difficult then as it is now to find decent homes for large families. And we moved around quite a bit in many early years in search of a house that would suit our needs. The first house I remember was on the corner of Fifth and Brush Streets and on rundown section of Oakland. It was two bedroom basement apartment and much too small to hold all of, its, all of us comfortably. The floor was either dirt or cement. I cannot remember exactly. It did not seem to be the kind of floor that regular people had in their homes. My parents slept in one bedroom and my sisters, brothers, and I in the other. Later, when we moved to a two-room apartment at Castro in 18th Streets, there were fewer of us. Murder, Myrtle and Le, Le, sorry, I'm trying to say their name right. Lilo, Le, Leola, oh, that's what it is, it's Leola, had married and Walter had been drafted into the army. On Castro Street, I slept in the kitchen. That memory returns often. Whenever I think of people crowded into a small living space, I always see a child sleeping in the kitchen and feeling upset about it. Everybody knows that the kitchen is not supposed to be a bedroom. That is all we had, however. I still burn with the sense of unfairness I felt every night as I crawled into the cot near the icebox. We were very poor, but I had no idea what that meant. There were happy times for me, even though we were discriminated against and segregated into a poor community with substandard living conditions, I never felt deprived when I was small. I had a close, strong family and many playmates, including my brother Melvin, who was four years older than me. Nothing else was needed. We just lived and played, enjoying everything to the fullest, particularly the glorious California weather, which is kind to the poor. Unlike many others I knew, we never went hungry although our food was the food of the poor. Kush was standard fare. Kush is made of, made out of day-old cornbread mixed with other leftovers, such as gravy and onions, spiced very heavily and fried in a skillet. Sometimes we ate kush twice a day because that's all we had. It was one of my favorite dishes and I looked forward to it. Now I see that kush was not very nutritious and was downright bad for you if you ate it often. It it is just bread, cornbread. Life grew even sweeter when I was big enough, six or seven years old, to play outside with Melvin. Our games were filled with the joy and exuberance of innocent children, but even they reflected our economic circumstances. We rarely had store-bought toys. We improvised with the materials at hand. Rats were close at hand, and we hated rats because they infested our homes. One had almost bitten off my nephew's toe, Partly because of the hate and partly for the game of it, we caught rats and put them in a large can and poured coal oil into the can, then lit it. 
The whole camp would go up in flames while we watched the rats scoot around inside, trying to escape the fire, their tails sticking straight up like smoky gray toothpicks. Usually, they died from the smoke because the flames consumed them. Oh, I'm sorry. Usually, they died from the smoke before the flames consumed them. We also despise cats. <laughs> Amen. Because we were told that cats killed little babies by sucking the breath out of them. Yo, that must be a Louisiana thing. We tested the tale about cats always landing on their feet. When we caught cats and took them to the top of their stairs and hurled them down, they would land on their feet most of the time. Dirt was a favorite toy. We used it to play at being builders. The roof of the house was our building site. We would climb up there and pull up the dirt-filled buckets behind us with rope, hand over hand, to the top of the house and then dump the dirt down on the other side. There were no swimming pools near us, but when we got a little older, we began to wander down the, to the bay with the other kids and go swimming after off the pier in the dirty water. Dirt, rats, cats, these are the games and toys of the poor, as old and cruel as economic reality. My parents insisted that we learn to get along with each other. When there was a dispute, my father never took sides. He was always an impartial judge, listening to both parties and getting to the bottom of things before making a decision. He was a fair and careful judge about all disputes. And later, when we had trouble in school, my father went every time to the teacher or principal to learn what happened. When we were right, he stood up for us, but he never tolerated wrongdoing. We were not taught to fight by our parents, although my father insisted that we stand our ground when attacked. He told us never to start a fight, but once in it, to stand fast until the end. This is how we grew up, in a close family with a proud, strong, protective father and a loving, joyful mother. No wonder we came to feel that our needs, from religion to friendship to entertainment, were met within the family circle. There was no felt need from, for outside friends. We were such good friends with each other. In this way, the days of our childhood slipped past. We shared the dreams of other American children. In our innocence, we planned to be doctors, lawyers, pilots, boxers, and builders. How could we know then that we were not going anywhere? Nothing in our experience has shown us yet that the American dream was not for us. We too had great expectations. And then we went to school. Had to grab some water. Uh, this is a this is a quote from Kenneth Clark, Dark Ghetto. The class of cultures in the classroom is essentially a class war, a socioeconomic and racial warfare be being waged on the battleground of our schools. With the middle class aspiring teachers provided with a powerful arsenal of half truths, prejudices, and rationalizations arrayed against helpless, sorry, hopelessly outclassed working class youngsters. This is an uneven balance, particularly since, like most battles, it comes under the guise of righteousness. Because we moved around a lot, I was growing up, I attended almost every grammar and junior high school in the city of Oakland and had wide experience with the kind of education Oakland offers its poor people. At the time, I did not understand the size or seriousness of the school system's assault on Black people. I knew only that I constantly felt uncomfortable and ashamed of being Black. This feeling followed me everywhere without let up. It was a result of the implicit understanding in the system that whites were smart, in quotes, and blacks were stupid, in quotes. Anything presented as good, also in quotes, was always white. Even the stories teachers gave us to read in the early grades, Little Black Sambo, Little Red Riding Hood, and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs told us what we were. I remember my reaction to Little Black Sambo. Sambo was, first of all, a coward. When confronted by the tigers, he gave up the presents from his father without a struggle. First the umbrella, then the beautiful crimson, felt lined shoes, everything, until he had nothing left. And afterward, Sambo wanted only to eat pancakes. He was totally unlike the courageous white knight who rescued Sleeping Beauty. The knight was our symbol of purity, while Sambo stood for humiliation and gluttony. Time after time, we heard the story of Little Black Sambo. We did not want to laugh, but finally we did, to hide our shame, accepting Sambo as a symbol of what Blackness was all about. As I suffered through Sambo and the Black Tar Baby story in Brer Rabbit in the early grades, a great weight began to settle on me. It was the weight of ignorance and inferiority imposed by the system. 
I found myself wanting to identify with the white heroes in the primers and in the movies I saw. And in time, I cringed at the mention of Black. This created a gulf of hostility between the teachers and me. A lot of it repressed, but still there, like the strange mixture of hate and admiration we Blacks felt towards whites generally. We simply did not feel capable of learning what the white kids could learn. From the beginning, everyone, including us, judged smart Black kids in terms of how they compared with whites, whether they could read or do arithmetic as well as the white kids. Whites were the standard of comparison in all things, even personal attractiveness. Bushy African hair was bad. Straight hair was good. Light was better than dark. Our image of ourselves was defined for us by textbooks and teachers. We not only accepted ourselves as inferior, we accepted the inferiority as inevitable and inescapable. By the third or fourth grade, when we began to do simple mathematics, I had learned to maneuver my way around the teachers. It was a simple matter to put pressure on the white kids to do my arithmetic and spelling assignments. The feeling that we could not learn this material was the general attitude among Black children in every public school I ever attended. Predictably, the sense of despair and literally I cannot say that word ever, <laughs> led us into rebellious attitudes. Rebellion was the only way we knew to cope with the suffocating, repressive atmosphere that undermined our confidence. Of all the unpleasant things that happened to me in elementary school, I remember two in particular. I had disciplinary problems from the beginning, plenty of them, but often they were not my fault. For instance, in the fifth grade at Lafayette Elementary School, I was 11. I had an old white lady for a teacher. I have forgotten her name, but not her stern, disapproving face. Thinking once that I was not paying attention, she called me to the front of the room and pointedly told the class that I was misbehaving because I was stupid. She would show them just how stupid I was, handing me a piece of chalk. She told me to write the word business on the blackboard. Now, I knew how to spell the word. I had written it many times before, and I knew I was not stupid. However, when I walked to the board and tried to write, I froze, unable to form even the first letter. Inside, I knew she was wrong, but how could I prove it to her? I resolved the situation by walking out of the room without a word. This happened to me time and time again, growing worse with repetition. When I was asked to read aloud in class or spell a word, my mind went black and cold. Everybody thought I was dumb, I suppose, but I knew it was the lock inside my head. I had lost the key. Even now, when I read to a group of people, I am likely to stumble. Whew. Brother talking a word, man. The other incident also happened at Lafayette. The school had a rule that you could dump the sand out of your shoes after recess just before you sat down. One day I was sitting on the floor dumping the sand from each shoe. I had quite a bit of sand and dumping it took time. Too much for the teacher, who came up behind me and slapped me across the ear with the book accusing me of deliberately delaying the class. Without thinking, I threw the shoe at her. She headed for the door at a good clip and made it through just in front of my other one. I know that's fucking right. <laughs> of course, I was sent to the principal, but I received a great deal of respect from the other children for, the, for that act. They backed me for resisting unjust authority. In our working and lower class community, we value the person who successfully bucked the authority. Group prestige and acceptance were won through defiance and physical strength, and both of them led to racial and class conflict between the authorities and the students. The only teacher with whom I never had trouble was Miss McLaurin, who taught me sixth grade at Santa Fe Elementary School. She had also taught my brother Melvin several years earlier, and since he was a model student, Miss McLaurin expected a lot of me. I felt in turn a responsibility to live up to Melvin's reputation. Miss McLaurin never raised her voice. She was a tranquil person, at ease and peaceful, no matter what was happening. Nobody wanted to start a fight with her. She was the exception to the rule. By then, however, even in the sixth grade, I had such a tough reputation in school, there was no need to start fights with the instructors. They were waiting for me and often provoked trouble, thinking I would pull something anyway, even when I was going along with the program. I went through a series of conversions and lapses. Each suspension brought a strong lecture from my parents, followed by a week or so of heavy soul searching and a decision to cooperate with the teachers and give my best effort. Mother and father argued that instructors had something I needed and that I could not expect to go into the class as an equal. 
I would return to school full of firm and good intentions, then invariably the instructors would provoke me, thinking I was there to continue the struggle. Sharp words, a fight, expulsions, and another semester down the drain. It often seemed that they simply wanted me out of the classroom. During those long years in the Oakland public schools, uh, public schools, I did not have one teacher who taught me anything relevant to my own life or experience. Not one instructor even awoke in me a desire to learn more or question or explore the worlds of literature, science, and history. All they did was try to rob me of the sense of my own uniqueness and work, and in the process, they nearly killed my urge to inquire. Uh, this is a Frederick Douglass quote, my bondage and my freedom. He who would be free must strike the first blow. Growing. Throughout my life, all real learning has taken place outside school. I was educated by my family, my friends, and the street. Later, I learned to love books, and I read a lot. But that had nothing to do with school, long before I was getting educated in or unorthodox ways. One of the first things any Black child must learn is how to fight well. My father ta taught us to play fair, and when I started school, I tried to follow his advice. His principles of justice did not prevail everywhere, however. Some games ended in fights, and at the time, I did not like to fight. My first year of school, kindergarten, was tough. I developed a habit of feigning sickness so that I would not have to face some of the local bullies. When the sick excuse failed, I, quote-unquote, lost my clothes and took a long time to dress. My mother saw through these excuses, and when she learned why I was avoiding school, she had my brother Walter Jr., Sonny Man, take me. Eventually, I began to stand my ground when others wanted to fight, and the trouble stopped, because Walter taught me how to fight and fight well. All of us at that time, around 1950, thought Joe Lewis was a saint. He and Jersey Joe, Kid Galvan, and Sugar Ray were our pantheon. I wanted to be a fighter too, which seemed possible because I had the fastest hands in the block. Other boys assumed nicknames, Winchester, Duke, Count, but Huey was name enough for me. I beat up all the kids on the block, not to be a bully, but to protect my dignity and to survive. Many of these fights stem from my middle initial. The way they used to say it, Huey P. Newton became Huey P. as in P-E-E, -E, Newton. And when a rhyme came at me like Huey P. goes wee wee wee, <laughs> I started throwing hands until, I, until it stopped. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> It got so bad for a while that I wanted to simply simplify life by dropping the middle initial, but my mother would not let me. On the streets, we had our little boxing matches. We wrapped towels around our hands for gloves and went five rounds while the winos stood around Betty Nichols and urging us on. They loved the blood, and we gave it to them. We would be in there swinging, bleeding, and crying, really slugging each other. The winos called me prize fighter because I thought a prize fighter received a prize when the battle was over. They sometimes bought me a 10 cent box of Cracker Jack, and I took the prize out of that, the only prize I ever knew. We could hardly eat the Cracker Jack, our mouths were so bloody. I never thought of fighting in terms of money. Later, I trained with Walter at the Campbell Street Center and had a few bouts at the boys club. My oldest brother, Lee Edward, had already left home by that time, and I began to grow up but he often came by the house to see the family. He taught me a lot about fighting too. Lee Edward had a big reputation in the community as a man who never lost a fight. Any boy of that time would have been as proud as I was to have a brother known to defend himself in all circumstances. Even though he lived on the block and saw some rough times, he never stepped aside for anybody. More than anyone else, he taught me to persist in the face of bad odds, always to look an adversary straight in the eye, and to keep moving forward. Even if you were hurled back three or four times, he said, eventually you would prevail. He was right. Fighting has always been a big part of my life as it is in the lives of most poor people. True. Some find this hard to understand. I was too young to realize that we were really trying to affirm our masculinity and dignity and using force in reaction to the social pressures exerted against us. For a proud and dignified people, fighting was one way to resist dehumanization. You learn a lot about yourself when you fight. Fighting is not just a means of survival. It is also a part of friendship. <laughs> That's so fucking true. 
all the people I fought as kids end up being my friends. And that was common where I, where I grew up. Yo, huh. reading this is right on time. I'm glad I'm reading this. All the time I was growing up, fighting was an essential aspect of camaraderie on the block. It took many forms. You fought your friends or with your friends, you fought an outside aggressor. If the neighborhood boasted a good fighter, word got around. That was how I first heard of David Hillard, now a member of the Black Panther Party. David was no bully. He never looked for trouble, but when attacked, he had great courage. He had won renown in our neighborhood as a brave adversary who, who never backed down. That is one of the qualities I have always admired most in him. And the bond that was formed then, 18 years ago, has held. I was 13 years old and just out of the elementary school this summer, I met David. My family had just moved to North Oakland where we were at last able to buy a house. David, who had come to Oakland from Alabama not, on, not long before, lived down the block from us. We soon became close friends. My parents were very fond of him and eventually, he became like one of the family. We have often wondered whether we may not be kin to one another since my paternal grandmother was a Hillard from Alabama. Hmm. David was the constant companion of my early teens, sharing with me all the usual activities of adolescence. Sometimes we spent whole days together, listening to records and rapping. Singing groups were very popular then. I could not sing and still can't. But David sings well, and he and some of his friends, Joe, Snake, and Early, had a group that practiced every day one summer, hoping to hit it big. Another interest we shared was girls. Some very pretty girls lived next door to David, which made the Hiller House a popular gathering place. The fall after we met, both of us started junior high school at Woodrow Wilson. Among our friends, there was a pretty girl named Patricia Parks, whom I had known for some time. The truth is, I think I terrified her. When I came on the scene, she would disappear. But when I introduced her to David, they hit it off right away and later were married. Patricia is not terrified of me anymore. David was part of my education. He still is. The steadfastness of our relationship cannot be put into words. Although we have been friends for 18 years and have been in many fights together against others, we have never quarreled or had a serious disagreement. We are different in many ways, but we respect each other's differences. Another good friend in junior high was James Crawford. He was a couple of years older than me, but behind in school. James and I used to fight each other a lot, falling out one day and coming together again the next. He could beat up most boys in school, including me, and when, whenever we fought, I would lose. But I always came back with some kind of equalizer, a baseball bat or a short piece of rubber hose with the metal insert. <laughs> We had to give me, he had to give me respect because even when he beat me, I would come back to him. James and I stopped fighting each other in 1953 when we formed a gang called the Brotherhood, which eventually numbered 30 or 40 regular members, all of them seventh and eighth grade black boys. Another gang of ninth graders were our allies. Crawford and I were the leaders. The Brotherhood, one of the few gangs in North Oakland, was a direct response to white aggression at school. At that time, Blacks were a small minority at Woodrow Wilson, and all the Blacks there viewed each other as blood relations. We called ourselves brothers or cousins and banded together to fight racist students, faculty, and administration. Back then, white staff people and students routinely called Blacks niggers, and tensions was high. Black students stuck together on the playground, too. We had outgrown hide-and-go-seek, King of the Mountain and Ringo, Ringo Livio, but our game still reflected our poverty. We spent hours rolling dice and pitching and flipping pennies. Since none of us ever had enough money to buy lunch or even milk, we gambled for these things. We also played what some kids called capping or the dozens. This is a game of verbal assault in which kids insult each other by talking about sexual liberties they have taken with the other opponent's mother. It is a very common game in the black community. My contests would often end in fights because I was no good at putting people in the dozens. <laughs> in the mornings, David and I often talked about how to cap Crawford. But when we got to school, Crawford usually outcapped us. A typical dozens from Crawford might go like this. Motorcycle, motorcycle, going so fast. Your mother's got a pussy like a bulldog's ass. <laughs> Yo. They were just words, and we were good friends in spite of it. Really tight partners. 
My years in junior high were a repeat of elementary school. The teachers attempted to embarrass and humiliate me, and I countered defiantly to protect my dignity. While I did not see it at the time, fierce pride was at the bottom of my resistance. These struggles had the same result. I continued to be suspended from school. My parents, the principal, and the counselor lectured me for hours, and I would again make up my mind to knuckle under go, and go along. As soon as I hit the classroom, however, there would be another provocation, another visit with the principal, and back on the streets again. It was a kind of revolving door. Each week, things were the same. The one class I took in junior high school that was not painful was a cooking class taught by the only Black teacher I had in all my years at school, Miss Cook. There was a reason my taking this class. Most of the white kids had money to buy their lunch, but my family could not afford that. Since I was too proud to bring my lunch in a brown paper bag and be ridiculed by my friends, I took cooking and eating. It was either that or gambling or stealing from the white kids. Crawford and I were in the same class and we were always getting kicked out together. I remember clearly one of the teachers at Woodrow Wilson, Miss Gross, we had heard three periods every day in what was called the dumb class. Only blacks were in it. We spent each day gambling and poking each other and generally raising hell. Crawford would shoot a rubber band at me or I would slap him on the head and then we would fight. And Miss Gross would kick us out. Sometimes she spent she sent us to the principal's office and sometimes she told us to stand in the hall. When you were booted from one of her classes, you were out for the whole day. It was a form of liberation liberation from the dumb class. Her class was particularly bad during reading sessions. We hated being there to begin with because we were not interested in what Ms. Gross was saying. When the reading aloud sessions came, we were frantic to get out. We could not read and we did not want the rest of the class to know it. The funny thing is that most of the others could not read either. Still, you did not want them to know it. At that time and earlier, I associated reading with being an adult. When I became an adult, I would automatically be able to read too. It was a skill that people naturally acquired in the process of, of maturing. Anyhow, why should I want to read when all they gave us were irrelevant and racist stories? Refusing to learn became a matter of defiance and a way of preserving whatever dignity I could hold on to in an oppressive system. Therefore, when it was time for Crawford or me to read, we made a conscious effort to get kicked out of class and we were usually successful. Then we would sneak out of the school and steal a bottle of wine or ride our bikes to one of the, our partner's houses and while away, the day playing cards. Later, after school let out in the afternoon, we often sneaked into the movies with our kids, with other kids, and or went to David's house and listened to records and danced with the girls. This is pretty much the way things went during junior high. On the surface, my record was dismal. Yet those years were not significantly different from the adolescence of many Blacks. We went to school and got kicked out. We drifted into patterns of petty delinquents. We were not necessarily criminally inclined, but we were angry. We did not feel that stealing a bottle of wine or cracking parking meters was wrong. We were getting back at the people who made us feel small and insignificant at a time when we needed to feel important and hopeful. We struck out at those who trampled our dreams. James Crawford had his dreams. He dreamed of becoming a great singer. There were days when Melvin and I sat listening for hours while James sang in his beautiful tenor voice. He was also a good cook and dreamed of opening a restaurant. James Crawford was talented, but the educational system and his psychological scars held him back. He never learned to read. To this day, he cannot read. His fear of failure was reinforced rather than helped by those charged with his education, and his dreams slipped away. As he became more fearful and frustrated with each passing year, James was finally expelled from school as an undesirable. Gradually, he sank into alcoholism and has been in and out of state mental hospitals since our school years. His face is scarred where the police beat him. This is the story of my friend James Crawford, another dream blown to hell. This one is from Paul Robeson. It says, here I stand. The glory of my boyhood years was my father. There was no hint of servility in my father's makeup. Just as in youth he had refused to remain a slave, so in all the years of his manhood he disdained to be an Uncle Tom. From him we learned, and never doubted it, 
that the Negro was in every way equal to the white man, and we fiercely resolved to prove it. Again, that was Paul Robeson, here I stand. This is changing. Hope was all, Hope has always been a scarce commodity in the Black community. Claude Brown, who grew up in Harlem, has written of this man-child in the Promised Land. When he returned to Harlem after an absence of four years, he had a hard time finding many of the friends he had grown up with. It seemed as though most of the cats that we'd come up with just, sorry, seems like most of the cats we come up with had just hadn't made it, he says. Almost everybody was dead or in jail. Many young black men in our generation can say the same thing. Drugs, oppression, and despair take their toll. Survival is not a simple matter or something to be taken for granted. When I look back at my early years, I see how lucky I was. Strong and positive influences in my life helped me escape the hopelessness that afflicts so many of my, count my contemporaries. First, there was my father, who gave me a strong sense of pride and self-respect. Second, my brother Melvin awakens me, awakened in me desire to learn. And third, because of him, I began to read. What I discovered in books led me to think, to question, to explore, and finally to redirect my life. Numerous other factors influenced me, my mother and the rest of my family, my experiences on the street, my friends, and even religion in a peculiar way. But these three, and most of all my father, helped me to develop and change. When I say that my father was unusual, I mean that he had a dignity and pride seldom seen in Southern Black men. Although many other Black men in the South had a similar strength, they never let it show around whites. To do so was to take your life in your hands. My father never kept his strength from anybody. Traditionally, Southern Black women have always had to be careful about how they bring up their sons. Through generations, Black mothers have tried to curb the natural masculine aggressiveness in their young male children, lest this quality bring swift reprisal or even death from the white community. My father was never subjected to this pressure, or if he was, he chose to ignore it. He somehow managed to grow up with all of his pride and dignity intact. As an adult, he never let a white man humiliate him or any member of his family. He kept his wife at home. He even, even though whites in Monroe, Louisiana, felt she should be working in their kitchens and made that plain to him. He never yielded, always maintaining his stand as a strong protector, and he never hesitated to speak up to a white man. When we children were small, my father entertained us with stories of his encounters with whites. He has not been well for, for the past few years, but even now, as he tells these stories, the old strength surges through him again. None of us realized it then, but those old stories were more than simple entertainment. He was teaching us how to be men. One time in Louisiana, he got into an argument with a young white man for whom he was working. The disagreement had to do with some detail about the job, and the white man became angry when my father stood his ground. He told my father that when a colored man disputed his word, he whipped him. My father replied just as firmly that no man whipped him unless he was a better man, and he doubted that that white man qualified. This shocked the white man and confused him so that he backed down by calling my father crazy. The story spread quickly around town. My father became known as a crazy man because he would not give in to the harassment of whites. Strangely, this crazy reputation meant that whites were less likely to bother him. That is often the way of the oppressor. He cannot understand the simple fact that people want to be free. So, when a man resists oppression, they pass it off by calling him crazy or insane. My father was called crazy for his refusal to let a white man call him nigger, or to play the Uncle Tom, or allow whites to bother his family. Crazy to them, he was a hero to us. He even stood up to the white men when they were armed. One evening, as he rode home from work with some other black men, for some reason, they stopped their car in front of a white man's house and began to talk and laugh. They did not see the white woman on the front porch, but pretty soon a white man came out of the house with an axe and yelled at them for laughing at his sister. The driver panicked and drove off. When they reached a corner, my father made him stop. He climbed out and walked back alone. The white man was advancing down the road with an axe. My father asked him why he had come out with that axe and what he had in mind to do with it. The white man passed off the incident lightly by saying something about, you know how these Southern women can be, and he had to make a show to satisfy his sister. <laughs> My father realized that in that etiquette of Southern race relations, this was an apology. 
He accepted it, but not before he made it clear to that white man that he would not be threatened. He never hesitated to make his view known to anyone who would listen. Once, when he felt cheated by a white man, he let all the town know what had happened. The man heard the stories and came to our house to see my father. This white man carried a gun in the glove compartment of his car. My father knew that, but he nevertheless went outside unarmed to talk. He maneuvered around to the right side of the car and sat on the running board with the white man in front of him so that he could not get to the gun. Then he told the white man what he thought of him and said, if you hit me a lick, the other folks will have to hunt me down because you'll be lying here in the road dead. The white man drove off and my, my father heard no more about it. Another time, some whites invited him to go hunting. To this day, I do not know why they asked him. They all took their shotguns. Knowing my father was a preacher, they tried to goad him into discussion about the Bible and the origin of men. Adam and Eve were surely white, they said. So where did black people come from? Their convenient interpretation was that blacks must have sprung from the union of Adam and a gorilla. My father countered by saying that Adam must have been a low-life white man to have had sex with the gorilla. At this, the situation grew fairly tense, but nothing came of it. His protection extended to every member of our family. At the age of 15, my oldest brother, Lee Edward, went to work with my father in a sugarcane mill. The first step in the sugarcane process was to feed stalks into the gasoline power grinder. The grinder never stopped, and it had to be kept full or it would burn out. This was Lee Edward's job. They had cut the engine down some and hoped that Lee Edward could run it, but he got tired his first day in the mill, and about 11 o'clock, after four hours on the job, he could not keep the machine full. It ran down and burnt out. When the owner saw this, he began yelling at Lee Edward, but before he could say much, my father was right there. This white man was over six feet tall and weighed 200 pounds, but my father got right in the middle of it. He shut off the motor and told the owner it took a grown-up to keep Kane in the mill. My father took Lee Edward off the job after that. He wanted us to be good workers, just as he was, but he also wanted us to grow up proud. I heard these stories and others like them over and over again until, in a way, his experiences became my own. Anyone who tried to bother us, black or white, had to contend with my father. It made no difference that the South did not tolerate such behavior from blacks. My father stood up to the white South until the day he left for California. He has never returned. The fact that my father survived these encounters may go deeper than a simple white defense mechanism. His blood was after all half white and that same blood flowed in the veins of other local people and his father, his cousins, aunts and uncles. While local whites were willing enough to shed the blood of black people, it may be that they were afraid of being haunted by the murder of another white. Statistics bear this out. The history of lynching in the South shows that Blacks of mixed blood had a much higher chance of surviving racial oppression than their all-Black brothers. In any case, my father's pride meant that the threat of death was always there, yet it did not destroy his desire to be a man, to be free. Now, I understand that because he was a man, he was also free and he was able to pass his freedom on to his children. No matter how much society tried to steal our self-esteem, we survived on what we got from him. It was the greatest possible gift. All else stems from that. This strong sense of self-worth created a closeness among us and a sense of responsibility for each other. Since I was the youngest in the family, all the other children had a deep influence on me, but particularly my three brothers. Of the three, it was Melvin who opened up most decisively of the possibilities for intellectual growth and a special kind of realization. Melvin is only four years older than I, and during childhood, we were constant playmates. Melvin planned to become a doctor, and I dreamed of being a dentist so that we could open an office together in the community. Somewhere along the way, these desires were lost, probably in school, where my scholarly ambitions died early. Although Melvin did not go to medical school, he was always a good student. Now he teaches sociology at Merritt College in Oakland. I always admired Melvin's intellectual activities. It was he who helped me to overcome my reading difficulties. When he began college, I used to follow him around and listen to him discuss books and courses with his friends. I think this later influenced me to go to college, even though I had not learned anything in high school. Melvin also taught me poetry by playing recordings of poems or reading to me. He was studying literature in school, 
and I was supposed, and I supposed teaching me poems was a way of learning them himself. We often discussed their meanings. Sometimes Melvin explained the poems to me, but after a while, I found that I could understand them alone, and I began to explain them to him. I seemed to remember poetry without effort, and by the time I entered high school, my memory held a lot of poetry I'd heard al read aloud. As Melvin studied for his literature class at Oakland City College, I learned Edgar Allan's poem, The Bells and the Raven, the love song of J. Alfred uh, Prufrock by T.S. Eliot, Shelley's Ozymandias, and Adonis's. I also like Shakespeare, particularly Macbeth's despairing speech that begins, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, creeps in this petty pace from day to day, end quote. Shakespeare was speaking of the human condition. He was also speaking to me, for my life sometimes crept aimlessly from day to day. I was often like the player fretting and strutting my brief hour upon the stage. Soon, like a brief candle, my life would go out. I was learning a lesson, however, that contradicted my best despair. While life will always be filled with sound and fury, it can be more than a tale signifying nothing. Adonis, I might be saying that wrong, too, had a special impact on me. The poem tells the story of a man whose friend dies or is killed. One of the best things in the poem is the sense that, with the passing of years, the poet's feelings alter and he begins to see things differently. He tells how he feels how his attitude towards his friends changes as time goes on. This was an experience I began to have near the end of high school as my friends drifted into the service or got married or tried to become part of the very system that had humiliated us all the way through school. As time passed, I began to see the fertility of all lives toward which they were headed, marriage, family, and debt, in a sense, another kind of slavery. Ozzy Mendez impressed me because I felt there were different levels of meaning in it. It is a rich and complex poem. It goes like this. I met a traveler from an antique glen who said, two vast and drunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, lies sorry, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that is sculptor well, those passions read. Which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fled. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing besides me remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. The poem can mean that a man's life is like the myth of Sisyphus. Each time you push the rock up the mountain, it rolls back down on you. Men build mighty works, and yet they are all destroyed. This king foolishly thought that his works would last forever, but not even works of stone survive. The king's great monument was destroyed, victim of the inevitable changes that come with time. On the other hand, it could be that the king was so wise that he wanted people to take their minds off their achievements and look with despair because they, too, would reach that edge of time where everything around will be leveled. Often it is impossible to understand at any specific period in your life just what is happening to you since changes take place in imperceptible ways. This was true of my own adolescence. My admiration for Melvin led to a love of poetry and later to my interest in literature and philosophy. When my brother and I analyzed and interpreted poetry, we were dealing in concepts. Even though I could not read, I was becoming familiar with con conceptual abstractions and the analysis of ideas and beginning to develop the questioning attitude that later allowed me to analyze my experiences. That led in turn to the desire to read, and the books I read eventually changed my life profoundly. Hold on right quick. Sorry about that. Let's see what time is it? 8.40, okay. I got time for one more section. This is section five. 
it's all about a kid like you who, I'm sorry, it's all about a kid like you were, who believed. It was born believing, but as he grew, everything around him, beginning with his parents and sisters, had teachers. Everybody seemed to say that what he believed wasn't so. Sure they did. Sure they said they believed. And they prayed and cried to God and Jesus Christ Almighty. But that was a few months out of the couple of hours in church each week. So somehow he became two personalities, one as sincere as the other, and then three because he could stand off and watch the other two. <laughs> the reason was that he, spec he suspected maybe the people who didn't believe might be right, that there was nothing to believe in. But if he accepted this and put down the beautiful, honest, good things he'd lose out on all he could have gained if he'd never lost his belief in believing. That's a quote from Charles Mingus, Beneath the Underdog. Oh, let me get some water. I, choosing. During my adolescence, often without realizing it, I was making important choices. Some influences in our early years are so clear that they affect that their effect cannot be denied. We also may unconsciously reject other influences as we go along. It is hard to say at any point how things will turn out. All the time, I was going to junior high school and getting into trouble, fighting on the block, listening to poetry and talking with Melvin. Other strong forces were at work. Often they were contradictory in nature and pulled me in different directions. This caused confusion and conflict later. Sorry, I lost my place. Oh, here we go. Until I learned to sort them out and understand what they meant. One of the most long lasting influences on my life was religion. Both my parents are deeply religious. And when Melvin and I were small, my father often read to us from the Bible. My favorite was the Samson story, followed closely by David and Goliath. I must have heard those stories a thousand times. Samson's strength was impressive, as well as his wisdom and his ability to solve the riddles put to him. Strength and wisdom, I still think the hero with my father in those terms. <laughs> I like David and Goliath because despite Goliath's strength and power, David was able to use strategy and eventually gain the victory. Even then, the story of David seemed directed to me and my people. When we were growing up, we went to church every day, or so it seemed. <laughs> Back then, the, the Antioch, I don't know how to say that word, Baptist church was only a little storefront where the faithful gathered. I belonged to the Baptist Young People's Union, the Young Deacons, the Junior Choir, and I attended Sunday school and worship services weekly. My father was the associate, professor, pa I'm sorry, the associate pastor for a long time. He liked to preach a sermon about the prodigal son. And as he preached, he really moved around in the pulpit, waving his arms and beating the stand. He terrified me with tales of fire and brimstone and how sinners and the unrepentant would end up in a lake of fire. He was a real burner. The whole family was involved in church one way or another, holding offices, bringing, singing in the choir, serving on the usher board or other committees. I was very active as a junior deacon, and every third Sunday, the regular deacons gave us their chairs below the pulpit. We sat in their places and administered certain parts of the services, taking up the collection and leading the congregation in prayer. Everything is set delivering the sermon. I did it all. I even read the sick list and special messages, although I had difficulty with the reading. None of the other junior deacons did any better, however. We were all pretty illiterate. If we were weak in reading, however, other activities compensated. I loved to act in plays because I had acquired a certain eloquence reciting the poetry that Melvin, Melvin taught me. It was easy for me to remember a part after I heard it once or twice. My activities in church led to music. My parents were so impressed with everything I was doing that they decided to have me study the piano, mainly as a good way for me to take a more active role in the religious services. I studied piano for seven years with some excellent music theorists and classic pianists. Looking back, I see that my friends and I were all in the same boat, heading for hell on earth and trying to reach heaven in church. Nevertheless, taking part in church activities and leading the services gave us a feeling of importance unequal anywhere else in our lives. For years, our pastor, Reverend Thomas, had a sign on the pulpit, prayer changes things. The congregation was encouraged to see prayer as the only way to salvation. If we had problems, sickness, accidents, final dif financial difficulties, prayer was answered. 
Everybody in the church prayed with you, sharing a common purpose that relieved tension and had a cathartic effect. No other institution in the community provided such an outlet. At the time, the church was the only stable force in the Black community, and while some people do not think it was very effective, it did offer a kind of permanence and stability to our lives. The church was always there, providing solace and hope. For me, the church was a source of inspiration that offered a countermeasure against the fear and humiliation I experienced in school. Even though I did not want to spend my life there, I enjoyed a good sermon and shouting session. I even experienced sensations of holiness and security and of deliverance. They were strange feelings, hard to describe, but involving a tremendous emotional release. Though I never shouted, the emotion of others was contagious. One person stimulated another, and together we shared an ecstasy and believed our problems would be solved, although we never knew how. James Baldwin has described this religious experience very well in The Fire Next Time. He writes about the excitement and ecstasy that can fill a church during the service. There is no music, he says, like the music, no drama like the drama of the saints rejoicing, the sinners moaning, the tambourines racing, and all of those voices coming together crying, holy unto the Lord. Their pain and their joy were mine, and mine were theirs. They surrendered their pain and joy to me. I surrendered mine to them. Once you experience this feeling, it never leaves you. For a while, I thought of becoming a minister, but I gave it up when I studied philosophy in college. I began asking questions about the concept of religion and the existence of God, and trying to find God and understand him as a, philosoph a philosophical existence. I'm sorry, philosophical existential being, I began to question not only the Christian definition of God, but also the very foundation of my religion. I saw that it was based on belief alone, the soundness of which was never questioned. Because I eventually found it necessary to question and examine every idea and every belief that my life touched, I reached a kind of impasse with religion. Yet its impact on me continues in different ways. To this day, for example, I rarely use profanity, People who have come to know me often ask why. I can only say that profanity was never used in our home. If I had been caught using it, my father would have punished me. My mother and father always lived as Christians, and this extended to the way they spoke. When I think back on the meetings in the storefront, it seemed to me that religion made an impression in, more, in a more important yet less direct way. It has nothing to do with personal system of belief, but rather an awareness of what religious actions can or ought to be. Something remarkable was taking place during every prayer service. When people in the congregation prayed for each other, a feeling of community took over. They were involved in each other's problems and trying to help solve them. Even though it was entirely directed to God and did not go beyond the meeting, it suggested how powerful and moving it can be to have a shared sense of purpose. People really related to each other. Here was a microcosm of what ought to have been going on outside in the community. I had the first glimmer of what it means to have a unified goal that involves the whole community and calls forth the strengths of the people to make things better. I'm sure that is part of why I was, drawn to, I was drawn to religion and why it offered so much to me then. At the same time, I was growing aware of a wholly different style of life that had nothing to do with religion. One of the reasons so many people found comfort and solace in church was that it provided, even though briefly, an escape from the burdens and troubles of the everyday life. There was another way of life, however, that did not seem to find this relief necessary. From what I could see, this other life also had none of the worries and problems that beset ordinary working class people. In our community, some people had achieved a special kind of status. They drove big cars, wore beautiful clothes, and owned many of the most desirable things life has to offer, almost without trying. They seemed to have gotten the things for which the rest of the people were working so hard. Moreover, they were having fun in the process. They were not forced to compromise by imitating white boys and going on in school. They succeeded in spite of the humiliations of the school system. As a matter of fact, they often won success at the expense of the very people who caused our troubles. They op opposed all authority and made no peace with the establishment. In doing so, they became big men in the lower class community. This was the world of Walter Jr., my second oldest brother, who was always called Sunny Man in our family. When I was small, he often took me he often took care of me, and I looked up to him. By the time I was a teenager, Sunny Man was a hustler with a reputation as a ladies' man. To this day, he has never married. 
To be a hustler means to be a survivor. The brothers on the block respected him and called him a hipster, even in, these, even in those days. When people asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, I said I wanted to be like him. To me, Sonny Man was much freer than the rest of us. Compared with my father's struggle, the way Sonny Man lived offered much to my hungry eyes. My father's constant preoccupation with bills is the most profound and persistent memory of my childhood. We were always in debt, always trying to catch up. From an early age, the bills meant I could not have any of the extra things I wanted. I hated the word so much it made me cringe inside, just the way I felt listening to Little Black Sambo and the Tar, Berry stories, tar Baby stories. For me, no words on the street were as profane as the bills. It killed me a little each time they were mentioned because I could see the never-ending struggle and agony my father went through trying to cope with them. It is a situation familiar to most people in the Black community. In one of his letters to his father, George Jackson spoke for me. How do you think I felt when I saw you come home each day a little more depressed than the day before? How do you think I felt when I looked in your face and saw the clouds for me? When I saw you look around and see your best efforts go for nothing? Nothing. I know exactly what he meant. My father always paid his bills on time. He might complain about them, particularly about the interest, but he paid. As I grew older, I would sometimes examine the bills he received, and I saw that in most cases, the greater portion of the money was going to pay interest. If he bought something like a refrigerator, we wound up paying double the original cost. Sometimes the bills exceeded his whole paycheck. My father never mailed his payments. Melvin and I took them to the stores because he wanted the receipt stamps. He felt that if he mailed the payments, they might make a mistake, not send the receipt, and charge him more. This, has ha this had happened in the past. Every two weeks or once a month, depending on when the payment was due, he would make out a list for us and arrange the money in separate envelopes, one for each door, with the receipts inside. Then when we returned, we would carefully check the receipts. For years, Melvin and I made the rounds of Oakland stores paying bills for our father. I was still doing this when I was arrested in 1967. When I became aware of the effect of the bills on my family, I wanted to be free of them. It was more than the bills that disturbed me, however. We were in an impoverished state, and I found it hard to understand how my father could work so hard yet have so little. He was a jack of all trades, carpenter, brick mason, plumber. No job was beyond him. He worked at two and sometimes three jobs at once, and yet never got ahead. After fin finishing one of his various jobs, he would hurry home and work around the house or in the garden and then go off to another job. He could, we could not understand how he did it. Never a day of rest or relax and never a complaint. I think the years of hard work are partially responsible for his poor health now. He was always a strong person and never stick, never sick until his later years. When I was older and had a chance to see how people in better circumstances lived, I saw that our difficulty resulted from the large number of people in our family. For years, all nine of us lived in three or four rooms with little opportunity for privacy. Until I was 11 or 12, I had to sleep with Melvin in the kitchen and sometimes before that in bed with my sisters. It never occurred to me that I could have a room of my own. Unfortunately, there was a great deal of affection and humor among us, but still it was hard. I see now that in those years, the idea took root in my mind that we were suffering such hardships through our own fault. I equated the idea of the family with being trapped and plagued by bills. At an early age, I made up my mind never to have bills when I grew up. I could not know then that the, this determination would extend eventually to the point of not being married or having a family of my own. My fear of being hounded by debt led me down Sunny Man's road for a while. When I saw how much he was respected on the block, I began to spend most of my time there. At first in the little gangs we had in school and at parties, but later in the pool hall and bars. For a long time, I was attracted to this way of life until I discovered it was not what it seemed. That came later. Even though I was attempting to be like Sunny Man, I nonetheless admired Melvin and his educational achievements. Both avenues seemed to offer a way but I could not know which road was best. I, I had seen Blacks take the education road and get nowhere. Many of them returned to the block, scorning their years in school and cursing the white man for holding them back. Other Blacks had apparently made it on the block, but ended up broken men in prison or dead. There was no clear pattern to follow. It was hard to know what to do. 
This dilemma faces almost all young Black men struggling to achieve a sense of identity in a society that denies them their basic rights. The Black teenager in his most impressionable and vulnerable years looks around and sees a contradiction between society's expressed values and reality and the way things actually are. The sunny men of the community who defy authority and break the rule, I'm sorry, and break the law, seem to enjoy the good life and have everything in the way of material possessions. On the other hand, people who work hard and struggle and suffer much are the victims of greed and indifference losers. This insane reversal of values presses heavily on the Black community. The causes originate from outside and are imposed by a system that ruthlessly seeks its own reward, no matter what the cost and wrecked human lives. This can be profoundly disorienting to a teenager trying to understand and define himself. Like adolescents everywhere, he wants an image to model himself after, and he becomes confused because there is such disparity between what he is taught and what he sees. Most adolescents in Black communities expect no justice from school authorities or the police. The painful reality of their lives from childhood on reveals that the inequalities they encounter are not confined to a few institutions. The effects of injustice and discrimination can be seen in the lives of nearly everyone around them. A brutal system permeates every aspect of life. It is in the air they breathe. In attempting to cope, the teenager seeks some kind of protection for himself in order to survive, some way of dealing with the contradictions that surround him. This usually takes the form of resistance to all authority. For any adolescents, it is the only weapon they have. Most of the time, the rebellion is directed against authority outside the home. But if there is no strong family support, it can disrupt their relationships at home. Even the closest families crumble because outside pressures are so relentless. To a certain extent, this was true for me when I was in junior high school. My rebellion was minor and never became a serious problem, though it caused friction for a while. Looking back, I see that it was a reflection of the confusion and sense of fragmentation I was going through, part of the process of finding out who I was. It was also the beginning of my independence. Everyone in our home shared the household chores. Mine were the usual ones, taking out the garbage and after my sisters left home, washing, dish washing the dishes and cleaning the stove. I also had to trim the hedges around the house. My father supervised the outside while my mother's domain was inside the house. I hated chores and always tried to escape them pedaling away on my bike and leaving everything to Melvin. I often stayed away from home until late at night, even though I knew my parents would punish me when I returned. Sometimes I made up fancy stories to tell them, but nothing could save me from punishment. I preferred my mother's whippings. She was more gentle. <laughs> but most of the time, my father did it. Another responsibility I failed to carry out was a paper route I had for a time. I spent all the money I collected and could not pay the bill. When the people who had paid money did not receive their papers, I had to give it up. This kind of resistance was due in large part to the need to assert myself as a separate person apart from my parents. I was beginning to want to make my own decisions. Often, this independence took the form of avoiding responsibilities. At other times, it was more constructive. Ever since I can remember, I've hated to see anyone do without the things he needs. This attitude probably came from my father's influence and the ideas he expressed in church. Once when I was about 15, I met a kid who had no food at home. This was one of those nights when I was staying out late and I brought him home and woke up my parents rummaging through the kitchen cabinets. When I told them the boy and his family needed food and that, that we could share ours, they did not object, although they were angry about my staying out late. Another time, when Melvin was going to San Jose State College, he needed a car but had no money. I had a small savings account, about $300, and I gave him all of it. My parents teased me about giving away all my money, but at the bottom, they were proud of this example of family closeness. Other times, though, I showed my sense of closeness in ways they did not approve of. Whenever my sister Myrtle got stranded at a party or somewhere else, she always called and asked me to pick her up. I would wait until my parents were asleep and then swipe the car keys. I did this every time she asked me, and every time I got into trouble for taking the car because I was not old enough to drive. My parents never spared the rod when I was young. As I grew older, the pun they punished me in other ways, but I knew they did it because they cared about me and wanted me to develop a sense of responsibility. I think, too, they admired my independence, even though it sometimes worried them. They must have known I was at a difficult stage of development. Most Black parents are very aware of the conflicting and bewildering, 
bewildering influences that surround their children, and they experience a deep anxiety over whether they would get into trouble with the law or at school. They understand only too well how the system works. The loving discipline exerted in our home was not lost on me, and when the time came, it stood me in a good stead. So I got to stop there. And I actually have to end the space because I got to help a friend out. Oh, Isaac, I see you requested. What's up, Isaac? I can't hear you. Your mic is muted. But I only got like another five minutes. I really got to go help this comrade out. So if you want to unmute and, you know, say what you got to say. If not, I got to end the space and I apologize. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the space, and I'll see y'all next time when I pick up on, on Section 6.